This is the Paracave Podcast, proudly brought to you by major sponsor Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club, and co-sponsors Bo Cook from Lone Market, Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics, Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty, BTZD Clothing, the official clothing partner of the Paracave Podcast, and the official media partner of the Paracave Podcast, the Parramatta Times. Welcome to another episode of the Paracave Podcast. And now over to your host, Troy Warner, broadcasting live from the world-famous Paracave. And yes, hello and welcome to another cracking episode of the Paracave Podcast. Troy Warner here once again with another interview-style podcast, which I really hope you guys enjoy. That's what I started off doing with the podcast, but now there is so much more content coming your way. But this is the once-a-week interview podcast that I bring out with a former player or current player or a fan of a uh, rugby league team, be it a Parramatta Eels fan or a supporter of another club as well because you know without the fans of rugby league uh, we wouldn't have a game so it's always great to hear from the fans about their love for their team and it brings back great memories for me and also it brings back great memories for them but today's episode is hot off the press well not really the press because that would be newspapers or magazines wouldn't it this is hot into the audio world as i've just finished recording it so it's going straight out and i apologize that it is a little bit late uh but i just recorded this one so my special guest today is greg bird now you may recognize that name Greg Bird because he represented or he played for the Cronulla Sharks and also the Gold Coast Titans in the NRL and also played for the Catalans Dragons in the English Super League but he also represented Australia the Kangaroos and also represented New South Wales the New South Wales Blues in State of Origin and what uh, better time to get a State of Origin player on to the podcast than now as we are in the midst of State of Origin. Uh, also, Greg represented New South Wales Country and the Indigenous All-Stars as well. So a great career that he had in both here in Australia and also over in England. And so we talk about that, representing... Australia playing State of Origin um, and playing at Cronulla and the Gold Coast Titans as well and over in the English Super League and we also talk about you know his good mate his great mate uh, Paul Gallen as well and no doubt some other things thrown in as well so um, it's a really enjoyable chat I really loved it I I'm sure you will too and uh, I really appreciate Greg for his time. Now, this podcast will also be available as a YouTube video as well. It will be coming out later next week, so stay tuned for that one if you prefer to watch the video version of this podcast. But if you want to hear the audio one, like you're listening to now, it is on Apple and Spotify, so please tell all your friends and family about it as well to have a listen Now, just quickly, this wouldn't be at all possible without the help of the sponsors. Major sponsor, Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Paramount Leagues Club. Bo Cook from Loan Market. Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics. Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty. BTZD Teamwear, the official apparel sponsor of the Paracave Podcast. And the Parramatta Times, the official media partner of the Paracave podcast. More details about the sponsors uh, of the Paracave podcast and Paracave podcast merchandise 
later in the show so stay tuned for that one but no doubt you don't want to hear my voice anymore you want to hear the interview with Greg Bird so enough of me talking and as Hindy says get a beer coffee whatever you want sit back relax and enjoy and let's get straight into it G'day, Greg Bird here, uh, former NRL player, uh, the Sharks, Gold Coast, small splash in the Super League, and of course, the New South Wales Blues. Go the Blues. And as you just heard from his intro, my guest today on the Paracave podcast is a former NRL player with the Cronulla Sharks, the Gold Coast Titans, the New South Wales Blues, and Australia as well. Also represented the Indigenous All-Stars as well. Also represented Catalan Dragons over in the English Super League. And it is Greg Bird. Welcome to the Paracave Podcast. Yeah, mate. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, uh, going back, growing up on the Central Coast of New South Wales, was rugby league always the sport that you wanted to play or was there others or yeah i mean i was in i was a newcastle boy mate well, yeah. it's close to central coast yeah but yeah. the other newcastle boy um hunter valley um yeah mate i always wanted to play rugby league i was a raiders fan as a kid okay um yeah my cousin you know my mum mum always loved rugby leagues our cousin plays for the raiders we support the raiders so uh, we used to go to every game. Um, his name it was Dean Lance. He was oh, yeah. the former captain of the Raiders. Um, yeah. played, played for Newtown Jets and a few other clubs around. But, um, yeah, so we used to go down to Marathon Stadium as a kid and, um, you yeah, know, go out in the, like go out in the hill and watch the game. And the, this was the heydays of the Raiders when, you know, they were untouchable through the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it was definitely a good team to bank for and then, He'd get me in the sheds and I'd sit on the laps of, you know, Laurie and um, Sticky, uh, Mal Meninga and Gary Belcher and, you know, Bradley Clyde, like all the superstars of rugby yeah. league. They're the, they're the players that I looked up to as a kid. And, um, you know, it was it was a buzz that, you know, I actually got to meet a lot of those players as, a, as an adult and got coached by a lot of those players, a couple of them, as an adult as well. So, um yeah, it was always rugby league for me. I love cricket. Um, yeah, it was always cricket in the cricket in the summer, footy in the winter. But uh, you know, it get, gets to the point when you start playing Harold Matthews and SG Ball, and um, and you got preseason training, and you have to train on a Saturday morning, and you can't play cricket anymore. So um, yeah, the decision was pretty easy for me when it come come to what I wanted to do and and what I wanted to to be when I grew up. Now, the SG Ball and Jersey Flag, was that with Newcastle up there? Yeah, played played Harold Matz as a 16-year-old, and then we played SG Ball as a 17-year-old. Played against Penrith twice in the grand finals and, and won both those grand finals. Um, so it was, a, it was a good, I guess, a good introduction into rugby league at, at, a, at a rep level, at a high, at a high, a decent, decent standard for me. Um, and then... Um, I tried to get a contract to um, to go into the top twenty five in Newcastle, and they uh, they weren't interested, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so uh, I got offered a, a full time gig with Chris Anderson. He took over from Melbourne Storm down and took over the the Sharks, and um, yeah, moved down there after I finished high school in uh, December two thousand and one. Long time ago. And then, uh, yeah, debuted the very next year. How was it as a young kid moving down the down the coast to the the Shire? Was it daunting at first, or yeah, it was daunting? It was daunting, but mate, it was it wasn't even a wasn't wasn't even a uh, a thought for me to go home or go anywhere else. Yeah, I was I was gonna make it. I was gonna do everything I could um, to to scratch, bite, and and fight my way. Into, into the NRL and I, 
Uh, it took a lot of hard work. It wasn't uh, wasn't easy. It didn't ever, like, even though it happened straight away. It wasn't, you know, I, I didn't. It, there was there were some tough times there. Where it, I got dropped back to reserves, and my my level wasn't up to it, so I had to keep working and, um, yeah, keep keep sort of refining my craft. It was it was tough back in those. It was a lot different back in those days. It was tough for me personally. Um, I think when I first started, we had a real uh, real bunch of senior players, a good strong bunch of senior players at the Sharks. David Peachy, Brett Kamali, Chris McKenna, Chris Beattie. There were a lot of, a lot of blokes that have, you know, I was a young bloke, I was 18. The rest of the side would have been 28 to 32. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, so it was, it was a lot different the way the teams were made up. I think most of the teams were like that back then. Whereas if you look at the teams now, most of the players are 21 to 25 and then and then there's a couple of the older boys um you know sort of dribbled in but um yeah mate, i mean i i loved it i love moving moving down there and um uh, moving out of home and fending for myself um it was uh it was quite an experience but uh I, you know i got got myself into a fair bit of strife over the years but uh i like to think i, I learned from my mistakes and and, um, you know, maybe the person I am today. Now, your debut game in first grade, what are your memories of that one? And was first grade everything that you thought it was going to be like? Yeah. Yeah, it was It was fast and it was hard. Uh, my first touch, we played against the Bulldogs at Shark Park. Um, might have been about nine weeks in. No, it would have been later than that. Might have been about eleven or twelve weeks in. Okay. Um, and yeah, my first touch caught the ball out off a, off a two pass from Greg Morley, and Nigel Vangana wedged me and yeah. nearly, nearly threw me in uh, the whiplash, nearly put me straight into hospital. But um, yeah, I got up, I bounced back. I think my second touch, I nearly scored. Um, so yeah, it was um, you know highs and lows. I, was probably wasn't on there for a great amount of time, but uh, I, I still remember. I still remember it. It's uh, it's funny. You don't remember every game. You don't remember some games, but you, you always remember your first game. Um, we lost the game, unfortunately, but um, you know it was uh, it was the first of many, thankfully for myself. Now there was a game a few years later against South Sydney. Uh, I think you got sent off in that game um, and served a, a long suspension in that one. Um, as a as a young kid coming into into grade, how did that uh, go with you mentally? Like, you know, you, you've only just sort of cracked it into first grade, and now you're out for an extended period. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't very convenient. Um, yeah, it was 2004 from memory. Um, yeah, I I sort of I got into the side 2002, and then 2003 it was sort of in and out. In and out, in and out. I uh, could never really, you know, nail down a spot. And then 2004, I thought I, my, my, my game improved, but at the same time, um, probably my uh, my attitude and my, my what's the word? Um, I, I tell my kids all the time, to, um, my ability to not give penalties away okay. um, probably, yeah. probably didn't improve so much. Discipline? Yeah. Um, Discipline, that's the one. Yeah, didn't didn't improve so much. And um yeah, I, I made stupid mistakes very, very mate, I, I had it in my head I was gonna knee in the head. Um but I didn't think anyone was gonna see it. Um I thought it'd be nice and close and I just glanced my knee past his head. But he sort of bumped me back and then I come back in and and sort of hit him flush in the head. <laughs> and then I looked at the camera and I was like, Oh god. <laughs> I remember going back, going back to center, and I was trying to hide. I don't know what I think, what I thought of with it. Well, I had nowhere to hide. Um, and Paul Paul Franze was the the center, um, and he said, "What did you do?" <laughs> I said it was an accident, and he just started laughing at me. He said, "No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't an accident." And then the the ref, I had my head down like that, and the ref called me over. And uh, you, you can hear it on the when he on the microphone he's speaking. He said the uh, 
the the up upstairs had a look at it, and uh, and you're gone. And he point, pointed. <laughs> no, he said you're gone. And I said I leant in and said pardon, <laughs> and he just put his arm up like that, and I, and I just put my head down and basically walked off. I think I got fed by uh, Brian Fletcher for about thirty meters of the walk. He, he was abusing me and giving me calling me every name under the sun and telling me everyone hates me, my own teammates hate me, and uh, I'm I'm an, I'm an embarrassment and this and that. Yeah, you know, I just I just basically went in, into the sheds and and uh, jumped in the showers and shed a few tears and and got on with it. But uh, yeah, um, after I served my well, my ten weeks, I still had a. Uh, Suspended fine hanging over my head from the club. Yeah. Um, um, I got, we played against Manly and um, B, I can tackle Beaver. Is that Brookvale? And tackle Beaver, got him in a good lift and tackle and he tipped over and then I got suspended for another three weeks. Oh, nice. So I think it was my second game back. So yeah, there was another three weeks in the sideline. Um, yeah, it wasn't good fun. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't it wasn't good fun for as a young fella. Um, I know that the trainer, the trainer took it took it on on himself to try to get that um, out of my game by by putting me in the boxing ring with uh, one of our front rowers who was injured, and he just punched punched the piss out of me basically for for ten weeks, and then I got another chance three weeks later. So um, yeah, it was. It was an experience. It was a learning experience. Something I probably didn't learn from because I uh, I got I got done for a few of those lifting tackles a lot later in my career. But uh, yeah, I definitely I definitely didn't um, didn't get any big ones in there for for a long time after that. Definitely at Cronulla. Who were the teammates at Cronulla that you used to like hanging around with and uh, like at training and after training and being a young fellow yeah. then? Mate, we had a really good crew, Cronulla. And as I said before, all those uh, all those old players, um, they probably played one or two years and then they retired. And then I was about 22 and uh, 22, and I was like a senior player in the group because yeah. cause I've been there for three or four years. Um, I was like a senior player in the group and all these other players were coming through and we basically had me, Gar- me Paul Gallen, um, I mean, Dykesy was there, another para, one of yeah. the para boys, um, and and Noddy. That was the, the senior players that were they were, the, were in the side, and then there was a heap of young blokes coming through. And we had a really good crew, like Ben Pomeroy, Kevin Kingston, uh, Brett Carney, Gal, myself, um, Matty Reek, Kenny. Um, yeah, we had a real good bunch of blokes and. And we were real, real, real tight. Um, it was, um, yeah, as I said, it was a lot of different times to to um, footy is today. I remember Chris Anderson back in the day. We used to we used to go to go to the pub on a Tuesday, and uh, after after training, and then everyone would have a few beers on a Tuesday. And, and um, you know, I was 18, 19 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. I was still on my peas, um, but. <laughs> You know, have a few beers and everyone would jump in their cars and drive home. It was just a, it was a different time, really. Uh, it was an experience to, I guess, see that side of football. I'm sure that was nothing, that was nothing like it was ten years before that as no, well. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, but uh, and, and then twenty years, be- twenty yeah, years before that. Definitely. But uh, it was good being able to, to be in the game when it was. No, it was professional. Don't get me wrong. It was, it was definitely a high level then. But you know, watch the game advance through two thousands into the teens, into the um, the modern day, and, and see how far the game's come, and um, you know how how every every single facet of someone's life these days is rugby league. Yeah, you know, from when they wake up in the morning to go to training, they finish training, they go recover, they go home, and then they go through that same cycle over again. So, yeah, it was a lot different back then. There's a lot more free time. There's a lot more team bonding focus sort of activities that that um, used to used to be um, mainstays on the calendar. But uh, you know, it was um, 
it was it was good. Uh, it was a good experience. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you guys were tight there before, and your great mate Paul Gallen. There's uh, rumours go around that he's quite tight with his his money. What's your best Paul Gallen story? Oh mate, there's there's hey, there's too many Paul Gallen stories. <laughs> there's there's too many. Um, many. There's, there's probably too many. <laughs> I can't even think of one. But he used to yell at me. He literally used to yell at me for leaving my light on. We lived together. Okay, and the, yeah. And the, the, the house was under his name. So he sort of put it upon himself to make sure he enforced the power bills and the internet and all this sort of stuff. And he used to yell at me if I left my light on because the electricity bill that we he had to pay. And yeah. So just like, man, it's like, go away. No, we, I, put, I did play plenty of pranks on him over the years. Um, about about his cash. Um, one night we went to a nightclub and and the bloke that owned the oh, a pub, the, the bloke gave me a water drink cards for the team. Um, and I he was giving them to all the players <laughs> except Gal. <laughs> and I told him not to tell Gal that they they got drink cards. And every time I was at a shout with Gal, and I'd go and get two drinks, and pay, give him the drink cards, and he'd have to pay his money. <laughs> 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 and I, I just thought it was funny. He, he, he reckons that I was being tight because I didn't give them to him. Okay. But I just, I just like taking the piss out of him. To be honest. Yeah. We, uh, you know, we we come through, basically started together and, and come through most of our careers together in Cronulla, and then, you know, most of it rep football was basically together as well. So, man, it was it was a good it was good having him around and taking the piss out of him and him doing likewise with me and. Um, but yeah, he's definitely tired. That's that's why he's still fighting. I think so he can keep making cash, even though that not that he makes enough on Fox Sports, and he needs to get the piss punched out of himself. Well, well speaking of boxing, uh, what do you think of his boxing? And would you ever take him on in a boxing match? <laughs> yeah, I'd take him on. I've taken him on. Before. I've taken him on before. How'd you go? Not in a box. Not in a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> Usually outside the pub. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I went good. I went good. I put him on his butt. I put him on his ass, and he knows it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. No, mate. We we both actually fought. We we fought together. His first boxing match was my first boxing match. Yeah, okay. Only boxing match. Um, we did a fight for life for charity event in two thousand and. 11, I think it was, okay. uh, over in Auckland. Um, we were both went over there. Willie Mason was on the same card and um, fought a couple of All Blacks. Um, I think Jared McCracken oh. uh, fought Carlos Spencer and I fought Rene Ranger. Can't remember who the other two fought, but yeah, that was okay. Gal's first fight. And then, you know, he's, he's obviously – Joseph Parker was actually main main main, main – uh, the main card on that okay. fight, and um, yeah, he was um, he was impressive. In fact, he was young back then. It was before he's he's had his world title fights. But yeah, um, yeah it was a, it was a good experience. It was hard. The training was hard for me. And I was middle of preseason, and I was going in two nights a week doing boxing training with my mate. He's uh, he's got a Muay Thai gym down the road. Yeah, and he was teaching me to box. Um, Nathan Corbett is like you know eleven time world champ Muay Thai. So to get in the ring with him after a full days, full days um, cardio doing yeah. at the Titans, and I could barely hold my arms up, and I'm half asleep, and he'd be punching punching the crap out of me. Um, but I me, mean, I enjoyed it. I um, I got a win, but um, yeah, I it was a it's a very nerve wracking experience being being in a ring on your own. Um, you know, I'm used to being on a footy field, and I've had all my mates around to sort of support me and. You know, I, I've always been involved in team sports, not too much um, individual sports. So um, it was an experience, but um, yeah, I don't think it's for me, mate. Gal's done an amazing job, to be honest. Like, you know, if he if he if he just stayed and fought um, footballers and you know retirees and all these sort of retired fighters, and you know, I don't think he would have. I, I would have been able to hold him in the same regard. Yeah. Or, you know, the Australian public would have held him in the regard. But, you know, the last couple of fights, he fought like Australian champion boxers. Yeah, man. And he took him to the. Mate, 
Mark Hunt, made the, the um, he he took him. He, who's he, the Olympian that he fought? Uh, who actually broke his hand on Gal's head and uh, couldn't go to the Olympics? Justice Hooney, is it? Justice Hooney. Uh, yeah. Man, that, like, and then he had another fight up there against another Australian, like Australian sort of champion fighter. But he he proved a lot of people wrong that that he's he was fighting hacks and he went out in there and. and Mate, he, he's just one of the hardest blokes. He's a hard worker, and he's a he's a hard he's a hard person. So, um, yeah, I take my hat off to him. I take the piss out of him a lot. Um, as as a mate, that's what yeah. you do. But uh, at the same time, yeah, no, you're very very proud of the the work that he's he's put in and and what he's got out of it. Well, let's hope we do see that uh, Sonny Bill Williams versus uh, Paul Gallon fight one day. One day, it's certainly been talked mate, about. The, Mate, they've been talking about it for ten years. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, they're gonna be, they're gonna be in their fifties. They still want to be talking about it. Gal will be Gal will be still chasing it because Gal loves the dollar. So <laughs> as we know, as we, as we just said, that's it. Well, you guys played a lot of representative football together, and we're in the midst of the State of Origin series. We'll start off with your uh, State of Origin career. What was your most memorable moment in your State of Origin career? Um, mate, I've got a couple. Um, 2014 was probably the most m- most memorable. Um, you know, seeing Ainsy run the ball back, like catch that ball, run the ball back. You know, game two, Sydney. It would have been so long, <laughs> eight years since New South Wales had won. Yeah. Um, you know, I missed the first one of that series, first one of that dynasty, that Queensland dynasty. I missed 2006, but. I played seven, eight, missed nine. I was overseas. 10, 11, 12, 13. It was, it was, it was hard. It was hard, hard to experience uh, as a player, as a fan. You know, as someone who's proud of what what they what they do, what they put out there as a as a as a spectacle for the fans. But um, yeah, it was disappointing. But the relief, the relief, the the, the weight that come off. Yeah. All of us. Um, when, when um, you know, Hocko threw the dummy, Hocko threw the dummy, Cherry Evans turns out, he runs it under the stick, scores the try, everyone goes ballistic. Yeah. Mate, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was it was a memory that I'll never forget that, definitely. But um, another one is probably my, my first starting game. Um, it was game three, 2007. Um, a debut game two in Sydney, and game three at Suncorp. Um I think Braith had a rough game in game two. And they uh, thought they'd just throw me in. It was a dead rubber. They thought they'd throw me in at 5 8, see how I went. <laughs> I didn't, hadn't really played too much 5 8 at, at top level. I uh, played a couple of games at NRL here and there, played a bit in reserve grade, but not uh, not too much. So, yeah, they threw me in and ended up getting man of the match. Um, and, yeah, that was, that was a buzz. A buzz when you sort of. When you're the best on the field in 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 that environment, like um, that's what sort of really built built that desire and built that want to sort of replicate that feeling. Again, for me, it was good that I got to do it in my second game because you know my very next game after that, I did I did it again. So um, yeah, it was it was um, I like to think I was sort of. Played some on, on best footy in that in that blue jersey. And being a proud New South Welshman. Is it a sort of a funny feeling? Is it uh, better to play at Suncorp in front of all those Queenslanders as a as a New South Welshman? Is that is that the ultimate, or is it playing in front of eighty thousand at at Sydney? Oh mate, I'd rather play in front of my own crowd any day. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're they're our crowd as the New South Welshman, but it didn't bother me playing in Queensland. Um, yeah. I, I actually liked I liked the bit of the banter. I liked the bit of the the chat, the bit of the the gobbling off it in the crowd and and giving it to them back and you know that that rivalry that that fire that heats up the the um, gets gets your head going and gets get the juices flowing. So yeah, I I didn't I didn't didn't bother me. I I found later in my career as uh, as I stated earlier, I was a bit of a hothead and I couldn't really. 
control my emotions as well as I'd, I'd sort of like to. Um, as I played a few more years into my um, into my career, I, I I felt that I really could control could control my emotions and and although I was I was tinkering on tinkering on red in the head, I was um, I was pretty it's pretty clear how, of what I needed to do and and um, the job that needed to be done. So um, yeah, I, I liked I liked playing in that style and I liked that that sort of fiery arena. Uh, State of Origin is the toughest football you can play. Do you think, though, it is sort of gone a little bit softer without the punching rule in? I mean, I know players don't go out to start fights and and the like. They just happen on instinct. But um, you know, we used to is we used to see back in the day, at least in that first five minutes of a game, Origin game. You know, some sort of blue would happen. We've seen the cattle dog happen, but we, we don't seem to see it anymore. D- do you think there's... Uh, there's also been talk about different rules in Origin as well. Do you think that's true as well? Well, I think the rules are relaxed slightly, um, but not as much as they used to be. Yeah. Definitely not as much as they used to be. Um, but Tady punched me in the head while I was on the ground. In plain view, plain view of the whole camera and everyone, they put on the big screen, and we got penalised. <laughs> Somehow we got penalised. Yeah, he, like, yeah, I think I think Gal might have cheap shot at someone earlier on, but it was yeah, but the, the, it was different. But man, I'm, everyone's everyone's for trying to include everyone and trying to make it nice and trying to protect everyone's. Um, you know, protect protect their bodies and their heads. And, yeah, it's. I think there's a place for that, I guess, in the game. But yeah, I, I do miss. I do miss that part of the game where you, as a kid, you you turn on the TV and you glued you glued to the action, just yeah. waiting waiting for it to erupt. Um, it's just it's, it doesn't happen these days. But you, you still get you still get a, a top quality game of sport. You, you get. Um, it is a lot more fiery. There is a lot less penalties, um, but you know the whole rugby, the whole game, whether it's state of origin or club foot, footy, is um, it's definitely mellowed down in that sense. Um, I feel like most of the games play with twelve players these days because someone's always sitting in the bin. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be yeah. Yeah, that's that's for sure. We'll, we'll move on to your uh, Australian career and you represented the Kangaroos seventeen times, and you're a World Cup winner as well. Uh, what are your favourite memories of playing for Australia? Yeah, again, the first game is always you know a big one. Yeah. That's all once one you really remember. Um, played Wellington. Um, there was the game that um, Steve Maddow wedged out and um, and hit Gaz first set of the game. We were coming out of yardage off, out of, off the kickoff. First set of the game, he's wedged in from centre. Goes his dummy to open, taking the ball short side. And Steve Maddai's taking his head off. Yeah. Um, Gaz KO'd, Maddai gone, sent straight away. And um, we actually went on with the match. Uh, and I think we won 54 nil or something like that. Um, um, scored a try. And yeah, it was, it was a buzz. But um, that was. That was a, a nice welcome into that arena. Uh, you know, again, like like State of Origin, it, it, you have the best players you can imagine either side of you, and yeah. um, you just you just want to you, you just have to do your job. And if you do it good, you know, everyone does their job good. You know, you get you get the result. You know, you're going to get the result because of the talent that's surrounding you. So, um, yeah, it was it was an experience. But yeah, the World Cup in 2000. 2013 was uh, was pretty pretty good as well. Like going over and being on tour for eight weeks, and you know there was a obviously that was in the the middle of uh, during the uh, the dynasty of Queensland, and there was going into that tour there was a lot of fire. There was okay. a lot of fire. Yeah, you know players weren't talking to each other. Like folks weren't talking. New South Welshmen barely spoke to the Queenslanders early on. Yeah, um, you know they've. There were there were a couple of scuffles during the during the oh, trip wow. and okay, yeah. um, but 
you know, as time went on, we all bonded and, and everyone was really close. You know, I still s- see some of those Queensland blokes as um, my class was good friends to this day. Uh, and, um, but yeah, it all probably come, a lot of it come from that, that experience, day weeks together and winning the cup. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was good fun. I've been over that part of the world, being out of your sort of comfort zone, not having, you not having your, your, your family and, yeah. and your, your regular circle of friends. You've got to make a new family, basically. Um, so, yeah, we, we bonded well and I thought probably played some of the best footy, you know, the, the Australian side's put on, on the paddock. We won, won at 32 nil the final against, um, a pretty star studded, um, New Zealand team that, that came. So, it was uh, it was good to get the victory. Now you didn't win a premier an NRL premiership during your career. Is the World Cup final is that the uh, biggest achievement that you achieved during your rugby league career, or as we mentioned before, the twenty fourteen State of Origin? Yeah, mate. Yeah, you know, it's, you'd always want to get a grand final. I played. We had the um, the Challenge Cup. The club, uh, the the Catalans won the Challenge Cup over there. Um, at Wembley, which was which was great, but um, you know, a grand final at the end of the year, you know, have the pinnacle of the season go through. That'd be yeah. that, that's the dream. It um, it took it took um, you know twenty one years into my career playing for Southport Tigers here in the Gold Coast to finally get a grand final win in A grade <laughs> last year. But um, yeah, it would have been nice to to do it at NRL level, but. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the things that I got to do in the game. Um, you know, as I said, you've listed, rattled a few of them off the origins, the all stars, the, the club footy. You know, that's that was that was good enough for me. I made up, I, I had a good career. I enjoyed, enjoyed what I did. Um, you know, it was a shame looking back that I didn't get a grand final, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I did my best and, um, you know, I got a few uh, few trophies trophies to to uh, to keep. Yeah, well, uh, you made semi finals with the Gold Coast Titans. What was what was your Titans career like? What was your favourite memories playing at the Gold Coast? Being a New South Wales from playing in Queensland, they were on your side that time. Yeah, it might, yeah. it's strange. It's like you don't even talk about Queensland New South Wales when you're playing clubland up here. It's not. It's only really during Origin, that six weeks of Origin, that it gets spoken about. Man, I, th- I thought that, that my my football was probably more consistent as I got a bit older. Um, I knew what I had to do. I probably wasn't bouncing between positions like I used to do at Cronulla, and um, I could just sort of refine my job a little bit better. You know, my big games probably weren't as big, but but my bad games were almost non-existent. So, yeah, I've... I've found myself just to be a lot more consistent as I got better and I got got older and more mature. Um and I mean, I loved it up here. I loved I loved the club. Um I love playing I met my wife here, I had my first child here. We live here now on the Gold Coast. Um this place I call home. So um yeah, I I uh, enjoyed my experience here. We had some good games but um you know, it's always when you knock off some of the big teams we had we had some games when we knocked off Melbourne, Melbourne, and you knock off the Roosters in Sydney, and um, you know a couple of other games, kicking field goals, kicked a field goal, a couple of field goals to win games. Yeah, those little ones stick in your memory, and they're um, yeah, they're, they're good to look back and think about these days. Yeah, you mentioned there, uh, you pretty much consolidated a position at the Gold Coast. You, you played a few positions during your career: five, eight, lock. Uh, second row. Um, did you have a favourite position that you used to love playing? Mate, it, it really depended on what team I was in, to be honest. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, whatever, what plays. Um, example, like, my, my debut for Australia was a 5'8", and um, <laughs> I had Cooper Cronk at halfback. Um, the way Cooper plays, it's like clockwork. You know, you know exactly what's happening, you know. The plays that are going to be put on, you know, where, where I, I just knew where I needed to be. Um, that's the way Cooper plays. He's very regimented and he's very, very organised. And that's that's 
the way Melbourne played for so long and been so successful. Yeah. But um, I probably had one of my best games. And then the next game I played, Thursday come back from injury and Thursday took Cooper's spot. And I played 5 8 outside um, Thursday. And I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. He was jumping down short sides. <laughs> He's so instinct. He's so yeah. instinctive. He's just, there, there's a game plan. And then I was to out wide. It's ready for our set piece. And he'd, he'd be gone. He'd be showing and going. He'd be, and I just got disappeared. I couldn't get into the game. Yeah. Um, so in that instance, I would have much rather played um, back row. And then a couple of games after that, I was playing back row with Thurster. Um, and that experience was good because he, yeah, he, as I, as, as I just said, he, he makes your job pretty easy. He sees space and he makes sure the ball gets to the space. So, um, yeah. yeah. At Clubland, I probably left left back row was my favourite. Okay, um, yeah. I yeah, used to like bouncing off my left foot and offload through the line my right arm. So yeah, that was probably my, my favourite position at club footy. But um, yeah, mate, it didn't really bother me too much. I, wherever the team needed me, I was I was happy to play 6, 13, 11. Yep. Um, just did my job. Yep. No, that's all the coach can ask you ask you to do, isn't it? We see the Gold Coast, they made the semi-finals uh, whilst you were there, but we've seen them sort of struggle um, for success. What do you think makes it hard for the Gold Coast to sort of make it to that next level? I, mean, I, I think leadership. Well, I think leadership from really, um, I think since we left, um, I think we, we had a we had a really good balance when we were here of, of young blokes coming through and and a lot of older heads you know myself Nate Miles um, Luke Douglas um, Zeb Taya a lot of a lot of blokes who have played a fair bit of football I think the last few years they've, they've just been struggling a little bit with that with that the, you know the the captain and I've taken nothing nothing away from Tina yeah. But he's he's a captain, and he's about I think he's like twenty three or twenty four himself. Um, he looks at him, and other than him, there's there's no real old heads. They got Kieran Foran this year. I think he's been great for him. He's been awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, that cool that cooling head. Um, he can he can steer him around the paddock. He can take a lot of the pressure off the young halves. At AJ Brimson and and, and these blokes, um, Campbell, playing playing very important roles. But as juniors, without the without the assistance of someone who's who's been playing a long time, it can be quite daunting, and it's 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 brought a lot of the brought a lot of the players undone at this club. Um, Kane Elgy, I thought was a legend, great player, yeah. Um, but not having not having been having sort of paired with with Ash Taylor, another kid who's about the, they're about the same age. They were they were all searching for some sort of searching for leadership and. And um, I was watching from France. Um, yeah, I thought that's probably an area where the club's probably dropped off a little bit over the last couple of years. Is, is having those leaders and having those senior players that can, you know, when when the game's getting tough, when the game's in the arm wrestle, to you know, to stick to stake in the arm wrestle and to to, to push push through those tough times. So um, I think they've 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 inadvertently done it now purely. Through experience of um, throwing them in the deep end, you know a lot of those players have played a lot of footy now. Yeah, you know AJ Brimson's been there for for five six years. Yeah, um, you know Tino's played four four years of of NRL. Um, you know they're they're leaders now, but you know for a period there it took them a little bit of time to get to where they are now, and I think that's what they were missing. But um, you know, I really hope the times come through. I'm, as I said, I live on the Gold Coast. I'm, I'm a Titans fan, um, um, but uh, it's, it's 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 hard to watch sometimes over the last couple of years. Anyway, yeah, I know how you feel watching watching Parramatta uh, play. Sometimes it can get very frustrating. What what was it like uh, during your NRL career playing the Eels? Playing the Eels, um, yeah, well, I've got one memory which is not my fondest. Oh, were you going to ask me about that one? No, no, yeah, no. no so please, to... please go ahead. 
Oh, what's the record? Parramatta's best ever win against Sharks. Oh, yes. 74, yes. I think it was 74, 74 points. Four. Yeah, I think Killer, um, Jamie Lyon scored 15 tries or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> mate, it was, uh, that was a tough one. That was, yeah, that was a tough day at the office. We, um, we started off in the back foot. It was, wasn't going too bad. And then there was a couple of scuffles. I think I was in a scuffle. Uh, and then Peach, David Peachy got 10 in the bin, then got sent. He was our captain. And then we played a little bit longer. And then um, another player got 10 in the bin. And yeah. then another player got sent. I think Danny Nutley. And then the tries, the, second, the tries in the second half. I think it was Dale Newton and... Who was the other one? From Maybe your side? Denny, Denny Nutley. Yeah, I think it was Danny Nutley. Yeah, yeah. We, and, and David Peachy. So we had three of them. At one stage, we had all three of them off. But um, we had had ten on the field. And they, you guys just went, just ran right on us. Um, I remember I remember one stage, it was before the last send-off, um, we, that we were behind the trial because I was doing the kickoffs, And... And we're like, boys, come on, we gotta we gotta do something. We gotta show some steel. We gotta so we gotta turn this game around. Now the game's over, we're not gonna win, but we can we can have, have some pride in ourselves and try to have a little bit of an inspirational speech as a young bloke. Yeah. And I was talking to Denny, um I was talking to Dale Newton, who's a prop from a Queensland prop. And um he was he's a madman as well. <laughs> and um and I was like, I'm gonna kick it down down to that corner. You want to bash the front rower, just bash him and get everyone buzzing, and we can get some momentum. Yeah. And I was like, right, I nodded his, nodded his head. I kicked it off, and they ran straight at him. I was like, bash him, bash him, bash him. Head eye, sent. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. That's not what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what I was looking for. That put us down to 10 men, I think, at that stage. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a pretty day. It was definitely something that, uh, I remember for all the wrong reasons, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Well, we'll move over to your English career. You played for the Catalan Dragons, uh, obviously in France, but in the English Super League. Was that something that you always thought that you were going to do? Did you probably get a little bit of a taste of it on that 2013 uh, Australian tour? Mate, I played over there in 2009. Um, like When I left Cronulla, I went there... Um, Went there for one season. Um, Kevin Walters brought me over. He was coaching the Catalans, brought me over and, and played. I think I played two games and they named me as captain. And, um, we played the whole season, got through to one game before the grand final. Leeds, Leeds knocked us off in the um, major semi to go through the GF and went on to win the comp. But um, you know, I, I, said to, I said to the president then, mate, I loved it then. And I said to the president, well, I want to go home to play rep football. I want to go play for yeah. New South Wales. I want to go back and play for Australia. If if there was no rep football, I, I probably would have stayed there. Okay. Um, yeah. I loved it that much. But um, rep football was always my passion. As, as I said before, I, that was the pinnacle of my career is being able to play that at that level. Yeah. I didn't have the luxury of playing a great deal of semi-footy. But, um, yeah, uh, the year that um, Sticky, uh, the year that I... I didn't make Origin, 2016, 16, I think it was, game three. Um, and they, they said, we're not going to pick you again and um, we're going to start breeding, bringing some new players in. I think I played game one and two. And then um, going to bring some new players in and then got a phone call um, to come over and they offered me a five-year contract. So I... Um, Went over there, played for three, and then and then um, began coaching over there for okay. for two as well. Um, and um, yeah, if it wasn't for COVID, I probably would have tried much harder to, to convince my wife to stay. <laughs> she was uh, she'd had enough over there. She wanted to come back, yeah. come back home five years. Um, and you know, being through COVID, isolated in another country, yeah, you know, in, a, in a country which was which actually dealt. Mm-hmm with a pandemic like Australia didn't really deal with a pandemic it was it wasn't till much later on yeah now, pe- people were dying in France and no one knew what was happening yeah. it was okay, well. this was when it first hit it was uh, I think it went China Italy France yeah so um, it was it was pretty 
pretty scary, really, early on. Um, but um, a lot of lockdowns. The lockdowns were extremely strict. You couldn't leave. You couldn't leave your house. Um, there were police roaming the streets. You had to have a written attestation of of why you were out of the house. You had to have a, like a list of tick boxes. What time you could only be out for an hour. Um, you could only be within a certain kilometres from where you lived. And yeah, there were a lot of rules and regulations. Um, there were police. There was a police checkpoint right at the front of my house, so okay. we could yeah. never get get away get away with sneaking out or doing anything like that. So. Um, not that anyone would even think about it early on, uh, yeah. because everyone everyone was you know basically living in fear. Um, so yeah, being isolated through that experience took a little bit of gloss off for, for my wife, and, and um, you know at the end of the day, we've been over there for five years. You know, eighteen months of it, she was locked up at the end, so it was um, time to come back home. Um, but uh, I do love the place; it's a beautiful part of the world. South of France. How was the language barrier with with the French? Did you pick that up a bit? Mate, I picked it up as a player yeah. to an extent where I was I was comfortable. I could, you know, order food at a restaurant or, but I could I couldn't really maintain a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't until I retired, um, I retired and, and I started coaching the the local side. We was a reserve team for for the Catalans, um, UTC. And they were a bunch of kids. They were all young, and none of them spoke English. Like none of them. Yeah, well. Um, so, if I was going to coach, I had to learn French. Yeah. Um, I wanted to coach, so you know, I started putting in a lot of lot of work. Um, most of the work I did was, you know, just talking to people. Um, you know, I, I, I did find I used to go to a pizza shop. Um, it was just a couple of doors down from where I lived, and I'd sit in there with a the guy that owned the pizza shop. His English wasn't great, and my French wasn't great, but we'd sort of speak. We'd speak to each other, have a few beers, and you sort of lose a bit of your inhibition. So, because it's it's nerve wracking yeah, being, yeah, being up, having to just you don't want to you don't want to sound stupid. No, you don't want to you don't want to be wrong. You don't want to um, stuff words up. So having having a couple of beers and talking to him was that gave me the ability to build a bit of confidence and and then start same things and he'd tell me how to say things and and then from there speaking to the team i'd have to do team videos um one-on-one videos i'd like i, I googled uh, rugby league terms yeah. out of a, on a and wrote them all down and then memorized you know what a tackle was a placage and, and what a, what the rest of was and, and then we had to so i could whenever i did it whenever i was speaking to a player i could Tell him exactly what I wanted him to do uh, in in his in his language. So, yeah, that was when I really learned the language and and started knocking around with a lot more French people and going to French restaurants just with French people. Yeah, you know when you when you played footy, you just hang out with the Aussies and the Kiwis and the Englishmen because that's, that's where you're comfortable. Yeah, you know, like that's it. you can it's not that you and... you don't like the other guys. Yeah, it's just that's where that's where you're comfortable. But you know, pushing me out of my comfort zone, I think um, you know really. Really helped me learn the language. And, you know, I've got a couple of lifelong friends, lifelong French French friends over there that I, uh, I can't wait to go back and see now. I think one advantage, I think, for former guests on the podcast, Daniel Wagon, I think he's over there coaching a, a side I, over I, there. I coached, I coached, I coached against Wags. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How did you go? Yeah, he, he, yeah well, he coached uh, Limu. Yeah. And uh, we were at um, at Saint Estev, Perpignan. And um, yeah, we went all right. We we beat them, we beat them. But um, they're they're a good team. They're a good. They had a, they had, they had a couple of really good coaches there. Um, Maxim Grzec, I think, was there. Was there? And um, yeah. But um, what, have you seen Wags lately? No, I've only seen him via Zoom when I interviewed him a, a couple of years ago. Mate, so. I couldn't believe how I couldn't believe how lean he was. Yeah, he was like because I remember playing against him and he was like bigger than me because I was a young guy. He was bigger than me. He was a, you know, like a back rower, tall back rower. And I swear he just lost so much weight. He was skinny and fit and healthy. And he looked really good. I think one of the for him, his, his wife was French, so he probably picked it yeah, up. It would definitely more. make it much easier to learn French if you can do it in your household. Yeah, no, nah, um, for yeah. sure. Well, uh, you moved back to Australia, and I've noticed that you've been playing. Uh, you mentioned you played for Southport there, won the grand final. Um, 
he also played in the Nines Premier League as well last year. How was that? Yeah, I played on the, with uh, that yeah, one hand Mitchell started. Um, it was good. It was a good tournament. It was a good spectacle. There's a lot of good footy on the two fields running. And, um, we won our first game and I got split. <laughs> I got split at about 10 stitches. Was there a tar- my face and target on you, was there? Or? Nah, nah, uh, no, 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 no target, no target. Um, we had a good team. We had like Zeb Taya, Jeremy Smith, Todd Carney. We had a few boys playing for us. He sort of picked it, but um, yeah, it didn't work out. I, mean, I only played the first game and ended up. Walk, walk into the hospital was next to the hospital in <laughs> okay. Rabina. Yeah. And then just and then I didn't get back till the last game. So um yeah, unfortunately I didn't get to see a lot of it, but I heard it was a great a great event. Um I'd love to play it again, but hopefully uh I, I get to actually spend a bit of time on the field this time because yeah, it was uh, there's a fair bit of clarity. Yeah, no, it certainly looked like a good spectacle. I was watching it a bit on YouTube there and uh, it's good to see yourself play and then the other players play and uh, players that I've watched in the NRL play. And uh, no, it's a credit to Anthony for putting that on. And uh, it looks like, yeah, it's going to be up and running again next year. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's a there's a place for it. Um, you know, rugby leagues, it's, it's, it's a sport that, you know, you can do any, any, any team, any team around the country could have put a team together and, Put a team of blokes that they know and they play footy together and they want to go away for a trip and go, go to an event like that. A lot of the teams, there's a team from Cronulla. Cronulla, I think, that won it. Or, okay. Um, there are teams from Port Macquarie that come up. There are teams from Brisbane that come down. You know, I, th- I, I think it was great. Um, it'd be, I think it should grow every year because because it was such a good event. If, if there's any people out there that... Uh, Want to want to put a team in? I'm, I'm sure Mitch and Mitchell will um, put on a good show for us. Yeah, definitely. We'll we'll wrap things up with a few common league questions. Um, what was the favourite game that you played during during your career? Probably not the ones that we spoke about. Is there one? Is there a club game that stood out that you just thought, oh, geez, I really loved that game? Um, probably the Raiders. Played the Raiders um, for the Titans. Um, went to went to Golden Point. Um, we we got the ball off kickoff. We we went and did our set kick kick deep and Fergo Blake Ferguson dropped it um, in Golden Point. Rocks and we diamonds. Had the scrum. Yeah. Fergo, his uh his nose his nose might have got in his eye. <laughs> Wait, so he couldn't see it coming. But um, yeah, he. Uh, we had a scrum and they passed it to me off the scrum and I kicked the field goal on um, zero tackle. So, yeah, that was one of, probably one of my favourite games. Now, you played with some champion players uh, during, during your career. Is there a player that you didn't get to play with that you would have loved to have played with? Um, Joey, probably. Okay. Yeah, I would yeah. have liked to play with Andrew Jones. Um, I played against him a few times and... You know, when I started my origin career, he just finished. So, yeah, um, yeah, that was – he's a, probably a player that I, I wish I got the chance to play with. I played with Thurstow and Smithy and Billy and G.I. and Gal and Boyd Cordner. And, yeah, a lot of those players who I think are, you know, the, of the modern modern day, are the best players in the world of the modern day, like, by far. Um, but Joey was one I missed. Who was the player that you thought – that was in your team that you thought you were confident that you were going to win that day uh, when they played, when you saw them lace up the boots? Um, yeah. I said I played at Cronulla and Cronulla and Tynes. We, we didn't go too good those, a lot of those years. So, um, I mean, it's... I think I think when you play in those rep games and you look around the room and you can you can see the fire in people's eyes. Um, that 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 tour that I told you about in, in twenty thirteen, yeah, um, when we when we won the World Cup final, looking around that room, um, knowing the form that we're in, knowing the players, the personnel that we had, I look at Kem Smith and yeah. Thurston and Gi and Jared Hayne and you know, Brett Morris, like. Everyone was the best in their position in the world, 
and then you just you knew they had the spark in their eyes and it wasn't going to be a problem. Yeah. Who would have been the hardest player to tackle on the field? Matt Bowen. Yeah. Matt Bowen is not close. <laughs> yeah. He made me look. He made me look stupid, uh, mate. I'd, 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 I'll tackle. I'll tackle Gordon Dallas and you know Junior Paulo and all these big guys <laughs> a thousand times before I tackle Matt Bowen. He, yeah. Yeah. The, there's the smaller guys that I, I that um, could really make you look stupid. Who would have been the hardest hitter that you played against? Who got you a beauty? You mentioned Nigel Wanganar at the start there. Uh, who else? Yeah, Nigel got me good at the start. Um, and Nigel Plum oh, yeah. got me one day. Okay. Yeah, he played for Penrith. He had head gear. Yep. Yeah, he got, he got me one day, which, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think I saw him coming. And he, he um, because he's sort of a bit of an unassuming, he's like tall and you sort of think he'd be able to wedge your way through him and he went straight through me. Yeah, don't worry. I don't think you're the only one. I think there's been plenty out there yeah, that, yeah. He's, uh, that he's gotten before. Uh, who was the biggest pest on or sledger on the field? Um, Either for the team Michael that you Ennis. played in. Yeah, okay. Michael, Michael Ennis. Ennis, yeah. I had, the, I had the luxury of playing juniors at Newcastle. So you come through the same Harold Matz as two ball teams that I was in. Um yeah, and, and he was just as much pain in the ass then as he was um, in the NRL, and he was in my team. <laughs> so um, I can imagine how, yeah, he was um, He was the best at it, mate. He was the best at it. He knew what he could say, he knew what to say to get you off your game, and he'd just bring people undone. But it, it, never, it never changed the way he played. Okay. Like he yeah. never got carried away even the emotion or the banter. He was in complete control of his own his own mental state, and other people will be losing their minds. As as Hindy will, as Hindy will um, um, tell you about it as yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, nah, definitely. What was what was one of Mick's best sledges? Can you remember? Mate, it, it wasn't any one thing. It was just annoying. Okay. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't just like a. It was. It was just a punish. It okay. was just a punish. Yeah. He just he pick up something. He pick up something about you that you you done or. You're doing or anything, and he just ride it, ride it, ride it until you you broke. Um, he never he tried on me, but I knew I'd known him for years, so yeah. he didn't really bother yeah, me that much. But um, as I said, I saw I've seen a few players really, really come undone. That's it. Who was the biggest prankster or trickster at the clubs that you played for, and what did they get up to? Um, pranksters and tricksters. We. We used to have battles back in the day, uh, Cronulla, early on. There's, there's me and Matt Hilda, and we terrorised Chris Beattie. Chris Beattie was an old prop, redhead. We call him Beirut. Um, <laughs> he, he was just a pain in the ass. Like he used to bash us. He used to bash us, little kids, yeah. and we just had to deal with it. He was a prop. We were young back row and back rowers, and he used to flog us. And we used to go and cut his, cut the, the middle of his thongs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the and he'd buy a new pair of thongs and he'd get some scissors and cut it. We didn't tell him. Um, cut the bottoms, cut the bottoms out of people's socks and they put the bottoms out of people's undies and <laughs> bags. Ch- throw chilies, chilies in drink bottles. Um, made an egg, an egg in a drink bottle. That was okay. a good one. Yeah. That, that's, that's probably one of the best ones, actually. A hot, a hot summer's day. Egg, egg in the drink bottle and you watch them and they're like, they squeeze it and they squeeze it and you're like sweating and you're hot, you need water. You squeeze and squeeze it. Nothing comes out. You shake it and you squeeze it and it goes, and it's just like the whole egg goes through the chute <laughs> and it feels like raw egg. Yeah, that was, um, that was some good ones. But, um, yeah, we, <laughs> me and, me and Matty Hilda were probably the ones doing most of the uh, pranking. Okay. Back in the day. No, nah, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. We'll wrap things up with the personality questions, a set of six. Um, what's your favourite holiday destination? Um, Croatia. Okay. A place called Trugia. Yeah, nice. Uh, what's your favourite sporting movie or documentary? 
sporting movie. Um, probably any given Sunday. Yeah, nice. Uh, what's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Uh, I like a spag bowl. Yeah. I make a, I make a decent spag bowl. Nice. Was, uh, was that your pre-game night before dinner? Yeah, basically. Basically a spag bowl or, or an, uh, like a chicken pesto. Yeah. yeah, but it was always pasta. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was a ritual, ritual. Which three former teammates wouldn't you want to be stuck on a deserted island with? Um, Gal. Um, J Moz and Andrew Fafita. And Andrew have- Fafita does not shut up. <laughs> he just doesn't shut up. J Moz, J Moz is a punish, and Gal's just a nerd. So <laughs> those three. No, nah, fair enough. Uh, if you could meet anybody dead or alive in the world, who would you like to meet, and why? Um, Warnie, Warnie, Warnie. I've not met Warnie, but you know, to sit down and talk to Warnie, that that would be an experience to sort of hear the, the yarns. And um, you know, I met him at a golf course in Melbourne. We're on tour once, and he was with um with Finch, and they they were um they were playing and. They were playing golf and we saw them, shook hands, and then they walked the other way. But it's like I didn't get the chance to see them. Yeah, okay. I didn't get the chance to actually talk to them. But um, yeah, Warnie would have been one that I'd, I'd love to sort of hear some of his um, battle stories. Yeah, no, nah, he'd, he'd have some great yarns, that's for sure. Who is your favourite band or solo artist to listen to? Um, my favourite band would be Unwritten Law. Okay. Unwritten Laws punk band. Um, yeah, I, I'm like I listen I like metal and punk music. Um, probably not many not many people listen to that sort of stuff these days. But um, you know, Unwritten Law, like when I do um, Pennywise, that sort of stuff goes through my radio and headphones most of the day. So, um, but yeah, I, I like older music as well. So, he's like Prince, Billy Joel. Um, David Bowie, um, Queen. Oh, yeah. What's your favourite Queen song? Um, Don't Stop Me Now. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that's a good one. Uh, not a lot of people probably mention that one, but it certainly mm. is a, a, a great song, that's for sure. Great band, too. Great well, band. Yeah, no, nah, love them. Well, great Did you see the movie? Yeah, definitely. Um, seen it a couple yeah. of times. Um, that's a cracker. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I forget who the lead the lead actor was, but he did a great job, won an Academy Award for it, and um, yeah. yeah, certainly a good insight into Freddie Mercury and and the band as well. Mm. Well, Greg Bird, thank you very much for joining me on the Paracay podcast today. I probably could have spoken for hours. It was really enjoyable and brought brought back some great memories of yourself playing and and uh, me watching you play and. I hope one day I'll catch up and say day and have another yarn. So thank you very much for coming on the Paracave podcast today. It's a pleasure, mate. Nice to meet you. Dylan, how you going, hey, mate? Are you a Paracave podcast listener? I am, bro. Okay. It's a great podcast. Mm-hmm. Everyone tune in. Wait, are you Go, Paracave. Well, welcome back, and thanks for listening to Greg Bird and his rugby league stories. There was some great yarns there, some great stories, uh, and as I said, no doubt he'll be... Uh, enjoying this state of origin period this next six weeks with game one uh, soon may 31 and then obviously game two and game three so no doubt he'll have his blues jumper on watching those games uh, cheering on the boys so uh, thank you once again greg for your time and uh, i really appreciate it and as i said there will be a youtube episode of or couple of episodes of this coming out later next week now 
uh, as I mentioned before, the interview, Paracave Podcast merchandise. So I have hats available uh, for the reasonable price of $15 that comes with the new exciting podcast logo. So all you need to do if you haven't already is to please email the podcast at www.theparacavepodcast at yahoo.com. Order yours now. Uh, for $15 plus postage and handling. Uh, get in quick today. Be the first or second or third. I think it is now because I've had a few orders uh, to post it on social media as well of you wearing your hat. Um, thank you for the support and listening each week. Thank you to those that have purchased the hat already. There's been quite a few of you, so I really appreciate the support. Uh, Also available as well from BTZD Clothing is the exclusive Paracave Podcast polo shirts that you'll see myself wearing in the YouTube videos and each week on the Talking Para Podcast, as well as the hat. I'll wear the hat as well and the shirt, so you'll see them on those videos and and pretty much any videos that I do um, as well, most of the videos anyway. Uh, So you'll be able to see that. They are only $30 each now there is I think one XL and two larges left at the moment uh, left in this first batch so you can order them the same way as the hats via the email address um, so that is www.theparacavepodcast at yahoo.com or if you would like to, you can do a combo deal. So a, a hat and a polo for $40 plus postage and handling. As I said, I think I've got one XL and two large shirts left at the moment. So in this first batch. So once I get rid of those, uh, oh, sorry, not get rid of them. So once I sell those, um, we can get some more and some more sizes as well. So uh, $40 for a polo and a hat combo plus postage and handling so getting quick for that one but of course this wouldn't be, uh, be at po- at all possible without the help and support of the sponsors so major sponsor Jack's Pale Ale exclusively available at Paramount Leagues Club in the club shop and also co-sponsors Bo Cook from Loan Market Contact Bo today on 0401213236 and get in contact today for a free chat and see what Bo and his team can do for you and let him know that you heard it here on the podcast. Also, Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics. Scott is a certified detailer with over 20 years experience in the industry so give him a call as well on 0449 84086 or you can see his work on instagram as well uh, so just search for brightside underscore detailing underscore ceramics and see the work that he does uh, he does some great work there as well. Uh, BTZD Teamwear, who I mentioned before, uh, with the polos, you can get in contact with them at www.btzd.com.au. Check out what they can do for you and your sports team. Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty. If you're thinking of selling in the Glenmore Park or the suburbs in the Penrith LGA, contact Shannon, who is a five-star real estate agent, and you can contact him on 0421 588 445. And also thank you to the Parramatta Times as well, the official media partner of the Paracave podcast. Thank you to all the sponsors. With your help, it makes the pod- podcast grow and reach much many more people, which is much appreciated. So thank you very much for the support and the listeners as well. Thank you very much for supporting the Paracave podcast. I really hope you're enjoying this extra content that is coming your way each week. If there's something that you'd like to see less of or if there's something you'd like to see more of, please let me know via feedback on the podcast app that you listen to. So... 
There's plenty of content coming out. The interviews I do with the Duckman on his weekend sports rap show, which is on Pulse FM 89.9 FM. Uh, there's also the Talking Para podcast excerpts. Uh, there is also the new NRL tipping podcast and the game day preview podcast. So, uh, if you'd like to see less or more or something different, please let me know. Have a great week as best you can now. As I said, State of Origin 1 is May 31, so just around the corner. I hope you really enjoy your Origin experience, your Origin footy. It is the best football you can watch, so get on board with that one i hope your team wins be it new south wales or queensland i'll be going for new south wales so i really hope you enjoy that one but please follow the podcast on the social media channels for some interesting content as well and also to see who's coming up next or what is coming up next on the podcast both on instagram and facebook so check that one out as well But to sign off the show, and as I always say, the Paracave podcast, by the fan, for the fans. Go, Para! Thank you for listening to another episode of the Paracave podcast. See you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Paracade Podcast. See you next time.